and Isha. As for Subh, Dhuhr, and any other prayer that has less than four prostrations, these rules do not apply. Whenever you don't know which rak'ah you're in, you are uncertain, you are unsure, and there isn't any probability, so it's completely 50-50. If it's not a four rak'ah prayer, your prayer is invalid, you'll need to repeat it. However, in the case of the four rak'ah prayers, if the uncertainty came after the second rak'ah, you'll need to do the following things. If the uncertainty is either between the second rak'ah or the third rak'ah, there you'll need to pray as if you're in the second rak'ah, so the, th the third one in this case, the other one. So in this case, you're not sure whether you're doing the second rak'ah or the third. You pray as if you're in the third rak'ah. Then you pray the fourth rak'ah. After you finish, before you begin to speak, you get up and you pray Salatul Ihtiyat. Salatul Ihtiyat has one rak'ah in this case because you're not sure whether you prayed the second or the third. You pray Salatul Ihtiyat. Salatul Ihtiyat, you only read Suratul Hamd. You don't need to read the other surah. You only read Surah Al-Hamd, you do the, the ruku', then the two sujood, then the tashahud, that's it. This is Salatul Ihtiyat. Now, if you are unsure whether you're in the, in the third or fourth rak'ah, again, the same rule applies. You get up, you pray, Salatul Ihtiyat, one rak'ah. However, if you're unsure whether you just did the second or the fourth rak'ah, in this case, Salatul Ihtiyat has two ruku'ah. So it's just like Salatul Subh. You get up, you pray, you pray, you say Allahu Akbar, Hamd, and then you do ruku'ah, sujood, just like Salatul Subh. Now, if you're unsure whether you did the second, the third, or the fourth rak'ah, so there are three possibilities, in this case, you'll have to pray Salatul Ihtiyat with two rak'at while standing up, then after you finish, you sit down and you pray Salat al-Ihtiyat two rak'at while sitting down, just like the recommended prayer that we mentioned for Salat al-Isha. I know it's complicated, but it's useful. If you're unsure whether you are in the second, third, fourth, or the fifth rak'ah, in this case, you're going to have to do Salat al-Ihtiyat as I just mentioned. Then after you finish Salat al-Ihtiyat, the two rak'at while standing up and then the two rak'at while, sit while, while sitting down, then you do Sajdat al-Sahu. Now what is Sajdat al-Sahu? Sajdat al-Sahu are two sujood that you do whenever you feel like you've added or you've decreased a part of Salat. Of course, an, an obligatory part of Salat. Given that, it's not part of what we mentioned last night, that it's not an essential part of Salat. So, what is Sajdat Ayasahu? After you're done and you're finished praying, before you begin to speak, before you do anything that invalidates the prayer, you do sujood. And it's recommended to say this, Bismillahi wa billah, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You get up, you do a second sujood, and you read the same thing. Bismillahi wa billah, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Then you get up and you read tashahud, that's it. Here, you finished sajdatay as-sahu. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It's natural that if you have a goal, that you work towards achieving that goal. And modern education pushes us into this way. For example, you want to achieve something. For example, let's say you want to get the big office. You want to become a president, a prime minister. From an early age, from primary school, or not really primary school, from high school, you begin to work towards that goal. So if you're in the US, you work hard in high school to get a scholarship to go to either Harvard or Yale because that raises the chances of getting to nominate yourself as a president. Or if you're here 
or any other European country, then in this case, you work hard in high school. You try to get good grades. Once the point comes that you have to choose your electives, you choose the subjects that serve that greater purpose. You choose English, you choose business studies, you choose legal studies, or any of these things that will help you out in becoming a prime minister. Then you try to go to, for example, here in the UK, you try to go to Oxford to, to study PPE, politics, or excuse me, philosophy, politics, and economics. If it needs strong uh, sportsmanship, then you'll have strong sportsmanship. Why? All to serve that goal, even though when you become a prime minister, you lounge on, you lounge on a comfortable leather chair. You don't need spon uh, sport, sportsmanship, but you'll try to do anything to achieve that goal. Normal people do this as well. And I don't need to elaborate too much on how people do the most outrageous and unspeakable things to get to their targets. For more information, just look at the presidential debates. They'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll deceive, they'll dig up old things on their foes just to get to that big office. Now as Shia, as Muslims, we also have a goal. What is that goal? What is our target? To serve our Imam. Why do I say that we have this as our goal in life? This is based on two pieces of evidence. Number one, the hadith about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. The Imam says, if I was able to live until the time of the 12th Imam, I would serve him for my entire life. And of course, we need to follow the Imams in all aspects of their life. This is one of them, that we need to serve our Imam. The second piece of evidence is something that the Imam himself mentions. I mentioned this last year. The Imam has a letter to a Shaykh al-Mufid. A Shaykh al-Mufid was one of our most respected scholars. He was the third or fourth grand marja for the Shi'as. The Imam has a beautiful letter that he sends to a Shaykh al-Mufid. In this letter, which I think each and every single Shia needs to read, study, and frame it and put it on their wall to look at it every single day. This serves as your to-do list. Everything you do that day throughout your life needs to fall under the umbrella of what the Imam asks you to do. And in that letter, the Imam clearly outlines what he wants from the Shi'as. Towards the end of the letter, the Imam says to a Shaykh al-Mufid, he says, فَلْيَعْمَلْ كُلُّ مْرِئٍ مِنْكُمْ بِمَا يُقَرِّبُهُ مِنْ مَحَبَّتِنَا وَلْيَتَجَنَّبْ مَا يُدْنِيهِ مِنْ سَخَطِنَا وَكَرَاهِيَّتِنَا And so, let every single one of you do the things that will bring them closer to our love and let them abstain from the things that bring them closer to our hatred and to our dislike. So we understand that the Imam wants certain things from us. Therefore, everything we do in life needs to be in line with the service to Imam Zaman alayhi salam. For example, if a Shia wants to serve Imam al-Zaman. Let's say a man wants to serve Imam al-Zaman. His career needs to be in line with the service of Imam al-Zaman. The spouse that he chooses needs to be in line with service to Imam al-Zaman. His akhlaq needs to be in line with the service of Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam. So, as a result, some things become clear. A man can't go into the field of OBGYN. Why? Because it's not in the line of service to Imam al-Zaman. A woman can't go into the field of urology because it doesn't fall under the umbrella of service to Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam. Now of course, except for if that field of medicine becomes wajib kifai. Now this is off topic, but I thought I'd mention this. We have two sorts of obligations, wajib aini and wajib kifai. Wajib aini are things that are 
uh, that are an obligation over all people. Salat, Saum, Hajj, Zakat. All people need to do these things. Wajib kifai are the jobs that are needed in society. So if in a certain society there's no one to bake bread, no one that works in plumbing, or any other job for that matter, then it becomes an obligation over all people in that society to get into that field. Whenever a single person or whatever number of people are needed for that field goes and fulfills their duties and responsibilities, then this obligation falls off the shoulders of other people. I'm not sure if I was able to explain it clearly. Anyway, so getting into the field of OBGYN for a man is only permissible if there is no woman that is in that field, that is specialized in that field. Anyway, so whenever we understand that we have this responsibility, this target that we need to serve Imam al-Zaman, everything we choose to do after that needs to be in line with this. It can't be parallel to the service of Imam al-Zaman. Why? Because then when the Imam reappears, there will be a conflict of interest. There's going to be a conflict of interest between the service to Imam al-Zaman and your career. Between the service of Imam al-Zaman and your wealth. Between the service of Imam al-Zaman and your spouse. Then, because you have worked to strengthen your relationship with your spouse, with your wealth, with your career, and you haven't worked to strengthen your relationship with your Imam, inevitably, you'll be dragged away from the Imam. So this is an, is an important thing to keep in mind, that everything we do needs to be in line with the service of Imam al-Zaman. What are we supposed to do? The hadith says, لا ورع أفضل من تجنب محارم الله The first thing that you need to work towards is doing the wajibat, the, the obligations, and abstaining from the muharramat. This is a no-brainer. It's obvious that you have to do the wajibat. You have to pray. You have to do, uh, you have to pay zakat. You have to go to hajj. You have to fast. These are things that you have to do. And of course, other things as well, like reading the Quran, like having good akhlaq with your friends, with your family, with your parents. Inshallah, I'll allocate another two nights to speak about how you're supposed to treat your parents. Anyway, so having these qualities is, is going towards service of Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam. Like what? In terms of akhlaq, there's a beautiful hadith by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. I think the hadith is narrated in Kitab al-Kafi. Again, Kitab al-Kafi is one of our most authentic books of hadith. Some scholars say that all the narrations in Kitab al-Kafi are authentic. Anyway, he, some, the narrator says that I walked in to the room and I saw that the Imam was speaking to his companions. And he tells them something that is really, really beautiful about manners and akhlaq. He says, if someone comes up to you and that person has committed a sin and you know about that sin, don't tell him about it. Don't bring it to his face and tell him, I know that you did so and so. Why? Because this will humiliate him. And humiliating a mu'min is not from the akhlaq of Rasulullah. And it's not from the morals of the awliya, the guardians of, of Rasulullah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are things that you have to keep in mind. That you, at the end of the day, are a servant of Imam al-Zaman. What would a companion of Imam al-Zaman do? You've seen how some Christians wear um, necklaces and wear bracelets that say WWJD. What would Jesus do? This is something that you'll need to remind yourself of every single day. Wear a necklace that says, what would a companion of Imam al-Zaman do? Or whatever floats your boat. Make sure that you understand that at the end of the day, the ultimate target is to serve Imam al-Zaman. Now, is it, uh, that could be by 
reading dua for Imam Zaman. And that, that's really important, by the way. Don't take the dua for the reappearance of Imam Zaman too lightly. The hadith says that at the end of times, when, there are a lot of con when there's a lot of confusion and there's chaos, the only thing that will let you survive is doing dua for him. The only ones that are going to survive are the ones that have tawfiq to pray for the Imam. For the imam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to first forgive us our sins and to give us the tawfiq to become true servants of Imam al-Zaman before it's too late, brothers and sisters. Because while I'm speaking to you, it's late. The verse you all know about Mary and Jesus, excuse me, Mary and the mother of Mary, when, what did the mother of Mary say before Mary was born? She said, Inni nadartu laka ma fi batni muharraran. From the time that we become adults and we are responsible for our actions, we should have begun to serve the Imam. It's, too, it's late now, but it's not too late. When does it become too late? The Imam says it in the letter. He says, when our time comes, that's it. If you haven't chosen a side before then, it's too late then. You've already become of the other side, the ones that won't support Imam Zaman, God forbid. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give us the tawfiq and make sure that you also work towards that. Make the decision tonight to work for the Imam Zaman. Everything you do, if you have extra money, even if you don't have money, you don't need to have money. If you could serve him by giving out tea or whatever it is, talking to other people, talking to the mu'mini, reminding them of our Imam, inshaAllah. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahireen.